Good morning, everyone. It's so good to have you with us. I'm Pastor Sterling Walsh. I'm the pastor here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, and I want to welcome you to a celebration of life for John. We all call him Jack Ken Kendig, and appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, and I know it'll be a blessing to the family, Miss Shirley especially, and all the other family as well, and just thank you so much for being here. Brother Jack served in the Navy on the USS Constitution, and uh, we would like to first give him proper military honors. And so I guess the, the color guard to come.
Well, we certainly appreciate Jack's willingness to serve, and uh, a lot of folks have, you know, it, you know, we, we think about the masses that go and serve every, every the masses are made up of individuals. And every, every individual, of course, has a heart and a soul and a family and all those things. And, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's still a, quite a um, co commitment to, to give their life and put on the line for our country. We appreciate that. Once again, I, I welcome you too, and I appreciate our, our the friends and some from work and from other folks, some some relatives, a lot of fam family of um, uh, of, of uh, Shirley's here, and some of our, a lot of our folks from the church, and just appreciate you all being here this morning. That's our word of prayer, and we'll begin our time. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the life of uh, Jack Kendig, and Lord, we want to bring proper honor to him and proper glory to you. So, Lord, we ask you to work in our hearts and our minds here. Pray that you give us comfort and peace. And, uh, Lord, you, uh, you will give us uh, uh, your, your, your peace that passes understanding as we yield to you. So I pray that you'll, you'll guide our thoughts here this morning. Thank you so much for what you've done. We thank you that uh, Jack had a testimony of knowing you as Savior. And uh, not necessarily an outspoken man or... A very vivacious, uh, uh, outspoken in, in many ways, but yet uh, uh, gave a good testimony of salvation, and uh, we know that he's, he's with you. And that's, we, can, we don't have to sorrow those who have no hope, but we have that blessed hope given to us because of that. So, Lord, guide our thoughts here this morning. We thank you for what you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, this uh, Shirley and I sat down earlier and, and uh, thought about some things to do with the service, and, and uh, of course she had talked about the Psalms here. And I, this is one thing I do often, and a lot of our, uh, some of our folks who are here have heard me do this very often. But again, it's such a fitting thing for a time such as this. Uh, Psalm 23 is one of those one of those passages that everybody seems to know, and we. Many folks years ago, way back when they had prayer and Bible reading in school, learned this, this passage by memory, and then many have learned it through their churches, of course. And uh, we, 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 we read this passage. The reason it's so well known and why they choose this out of, it's not because it's a sweet little passage about a shepherd and some sheep, but it's very, it's very rich with every word. And I want to read it to you and give a little commentary, if you will, as we walk through it. I think it may help us during this day. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you find that in the Bible, it means Jehovah, the God of creation, the one who put everything together in him, all, who all things consist, uh, the one who, who spoke the word and said, Let there be light, and there was light. The one who, who, who loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross and pay for our sins. This is the Lord. That Lord, the God of all creation, is my shepherd. Now, if you know Christ as your Savior, he's your shepherd. Now, sometimes we are, we are all, sometimes we're like sheep that have gone astray, as it says in Isaiah 53. But he's still our shepherd. He's not going to force us to come back to him, but he certainly comes looking for us in our heart. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my caretaker. He's the one who, who watches out for me. In times like these, when you feel like you're all alone, and you're having to go through these things, and, and maybe some, someone you leaned on is gone, remember, the Lord is your shepherd. And it says, almost, you almost it doesn't even need to be spoken. I shall not want. When I've got someone caring for me, the providing for me, want to make sure that I have what I need, and that person is the God of the creation, God of all the universe, is my shepherd, my caretaker, the one who will seek me out. What can I want? Because he knows exactly what I need. In fact, he says, the Bible says, he'll answer our prayers before we're asked. But what's a shepherd doing? Verse 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me by, beside the still waters. He wants to take care of us. He wants to have a good life. Didn't necessarily want to have a, a, a filthy rich life, but he wants to have a good life. He wants to have peace. He wants us to have a, a joy. He wants us to enjoy life. He wants to take us to the green pastures and the still waters. Every good and perfect gift comes from, from above, from the Father of lights. In him is no turning. 
so that he loves us and he wants what's best for us. We've got to remember that, even in times like this, because watch. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. What's he doing? He restoreth my soul. He's restoring my soul. In other words, he, he says, I'm taking care of it. I'm going to make sure every day, and I don't know about you, I like to eat every day. And he knows we've got to be fed every day. But he also, we want to know that relationship with him every day. We want to know that he's there for us every day. We, he's, our, he's our shepherd. He restoreth my soul. How's he does, how, how does he do that? He goes on and says, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let me say his name's sake first of all. We don't deserve it. We're just, we're just, uh, oh, if you, by the way, sheep are a mess. And if you ever, ever raised, if you know anything about sheep, they're not very smart. And uh, they just kind of get themselves in trouble. And they easily, easily wander off and follow the other one into this pit or that pit or this problem, into briars or whatever it is. And they get their, their little woolly coats stuck, stuck in the briars and, they, and someone's got to res rescue them. It's not that we are anything great, but he loves us because that's who he is. He's love. God is, is love. And it says he, he, he leads us into paths of righteousness. Where's he leading us to? The green pastures and the still waters. And how's he going to get us there? In the path of righteousness, not in the path of sin. Not out in the briars and the snares and so forth. It may be a little path. You know, the Bible says there's a, there's a way that's broad that everybody seems to be going at, but it leads to destruction. But it's as straight as a gate and narrows the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. That little path. That's why it's just a path because a few... There's very few that travel that little path. But, we could, but he'll take everyone we, that's willing to come. He's, he's going to lead us on the paths of righteousness. So he leads us through right things. Now watch this. While he's leading us through right things, the right path, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Sometimes that path leads through some things we don't want to go through, like today. Jack... Now, it's important that man wants to die after that to judgment. I understand that. But that's because we're all human. But Jack isn't gone today because of any particular thing, great sin that he committed. It, it's, it's important that a man wants to die. And in the path, when we even, even seek the Lord, all men will one day meet the Lord. Sometimes there's just some dark times in our life. And we may be doing exactly what God wants us to do. And it leads through some times where you're, you feel, ever feel dark? It's so dark you can feel it. He says, I'm the, the, yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's okay. Because, see, that path is part of the paths of righteousness. And he's leading me to the green pastures and the still waters. And so that's just part of it. And I don't have to fear an evil, for thou art with me. He's right there. Thy rod and thy staff, it says, they comfort me. Now God kind of prods us here and he prods us here and you know sometimes he every once in a while he needs a, he needs to use a tuba for on me but for most folks it's, it's a little prodding here and a little prodding there and he's trying to get it to get us going the right direction you know what that means he's still there watching me he's still my shepherd sometimes we even kick against the uh, shepherd we shouldn't because the lord's our shepherd he's leading us to green pastures and still waters for his name's sake So even when it, when it goes to the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil, for he's with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He says, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know what that means? Sometimes we're in the presence of enemies. It's life. For some reason, everybody's against me for some reason. The Lord has not left you when that happens. If we will trust the shepherd and obey the shepherd, Stay, walk where the shepherd wants on those paths of righteousness. We'll be where the shepherd is. And he says, I will prepare a table right there in the middle in front of the whole bunch and take care of you anyway. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And part of the same sentence is, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In the Old Testament, anointing with oil is a picture of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. And he says, listen, when I'm in the middle of all my enemies and they're, and they're coming down, first of all, he's going to prepare a table. He's going to provide for me.
But he says, my presence, his presence is going to be right there. He's going to anoint my head with oil. My, his presence is going to be very clear. And lo- listen, not just a little bit. He says, he's, my cup runneth over. He's going to anoint my oil till I'm just, I'm just, in fact, the Old Testament talked about how they anointed Aaron and it ran down over the whole body. He says, I don't want just God close to me. I want him all over me. That's what he says. I want to feel him all over my life. Now watch, now here's the, here's the summary of the whole thing. When we're allowing the Lord to be our shepherd, you know him as our Savior, and now we're walking with him in the paths of righteousness as he leads us to the green pastures and still waters. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy. By the way, mercy, you know what that means? I'm going to mess up, but my shepherd's still going to love me. I'm going to mess up, but he's not going to toss me away. I'm so glad I have mercy. I don't want justice. I want mercy. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's what I have. But wait a minute. At the end of that path of righteousness, he goes on and says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My final destination. God will walk, walk me through this life step by step by step. And yeah, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to worry because fear no, because he's with me. I can feel his rod and his staff there. They comfort me, actually, because I know he's there. And so surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all those days. The fact is, it's not done there. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a wonderful thing. You know, when you went to, went to uh, high school, you come to a place, some people call it graduation. Some people call it commencement. Now, that's a good old southern word. I'm going to commence the doing. Commence means to begin. When you get finished the graduation day, get finished school and have graduation day, it's commencement. It's the beginning of life. And I know that we have learned a lot of things. We live through this life. What was it? It was 77 years, I think, for Jack. But uh, last Saturday was commencement day. Life really began. That's just as real as I'm standing here. God put it in black and white. And we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, it says in 1 Thessalonians, then we have a life with him for eternity. I want to share a few thoughts about Jack. And if, when we're finished here, uh, our gentlemen have a wireless microphone. They'll come, come around to you. If you have a, something you'd like to share real quick, we'll, we'll give you a chance to do that. And uh, so you think about that as we, as I share a few things here. John C. Kendig, Jack, was born on October 6, 1942 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He was one of four children born to the late Roland and Esther Whitman Kendig. He is a brother of Donna Yuri, Diane Ubertaccio. Ubertaccio, did I say that right? Close and Gerald Ken- Kendig. His uh, early years were spent in Lancaster. Then his family moved to New Jersey for a while, and Jack enjoyed uh, palling around with his brother Jerry. He also took care of his sister Diane while his mother worked. She was uh, his, his pride and joy, apparently, whether she knew it or not. He, she, he, that's by the way he, he uh, referred to her. But Diane unfortunately passed away some years ago with uh, MS, I know that was probably difficult for him. After high school, Jack went into the military, serving in the U.S. Navy on the aircraft carrier, the USS Constitution, during the Vietnam War. After the uh, military, Jack moved back to Pennsylvania into the York area, and he worked as a machine operator for Modern Printing Press, and uh, actually spent some time going around the country to some other places, helping to set up printing presses and other equipment with uh, some publishing houses and so forth. Most recently, 
Jack worked part-time for Win Winter's Performance as machine operator. And uh, you could tell Jack liked to stay busy. In fact, I saw a Winter's truck out here somewhere. I'm not sure who was that brought that in, but uh, uh, that's good. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. In August of 2008, uh, Jack met Shirley Crone, a uh, mutual friend, Pearl. Uh, tried to set them up on several times, and, uh, but Shirley really was not looking for a gentleman caller at that point, but uh, Pearl was persistent, and uh, she tried to set up a dinner date for them to meet at a restaurant, but Shirley said, I'm not going into a restaurant looking for a man. So uh, Pearl asked, well, it, could Jack give her a call? So Shirley agreed. And so they did meet a little, at a little diner here in town and uh, got a chance to get, get, get to talking. And they chatted a little while, and Shirley said they just hit it off. He was just so easy to talk to. She, uh, she mentioned it can be, you know, some, sometimes it can be very difficult to find someone you just hit it off with, but that was not the way it was with her and Jack. And uh, so Shirley said a little while later on that first date, Jack uh, asked if she wanted to go play miniature golf down here at Max. And uh, she, she agreed, and the rest is history. And they have been together for 12, 12 years. They have been pretty much inseparable. After they had uh, been together for a little while, about a year or so, Jack gave Shirley an engagement ring on the tailgate of his vehicle, and uh, he talked her into taking it. And uh, appreciate I know she has... Um, I want to uh, thank Shirley publicly, actually, for uh, taking care of the responsibility of caring for Jack, and especially in these last few, few months. And Jack had received some less than glowing health reports from the doctor just back in April. It's been very quick. And uh, Shirley stepped right in, even tending to Jack, Jack's house and property. I caught her mow mowing the lawn one day and uh, out there, Jackson. I know that he was very special to her. I know he was. I appreciate that. I want to give you uh, an opportunity. Do you have anything, any, any quick words you all would like to share? Uh, we'll bring the microphone around. I think we have one here. And it'll probably maybe get things going. thinking, and now in Jack, he was saying, Betty Lou, you've got to get this just right. So the more I was thinking about getting it right, the more I was talking to the laptop. But I did get it written out, and it's called Heaven Has One More Hero. Jack, upon this earth, you served the Navy with pride. You fought for the red, white, and blue, and for that we are very proud, and we thank you. When heaven needed a soldier, you stepped up to answer the call to join God's army and stand along with them all. There are no rules, wars in heaven, no pain or suffering. You gathered all the soldiers just to hear the angels sing. You are serving in God's army now, and we are proud for you to strive to serve his holy kingdom. In Christ you are alive. Thank you very much. appreciate that. Anybody else have a word or two they'd like to just share? Just a thought? Just a, you know, think about Jack is what I think of, or I remember a time where it could be humorous, or it could be some, some, something a little more on the serious side. That's okay. Anybody have, have anything you'd like to share here this morning? I uh, work with Jack at uh, Winters, and... Uh, we got to be good friends there, and uh, we would, uh, I'd bring in some goodies, and I'd share them with him, and he'd bring some in and share them with me, and uh, he asked me one day, he said, uh, you ever have a cheesesteak sub from uh, Smith's over in uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia? 
And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, you ought to go over there and try it. <laughs> I said, okay. And uh, anyway, this went on for a while, and he, he would say, did you go over? I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, I, I, have, we, I belong to a group of people that get together and go over there and have eats and other places also. And uh, he said, why don't you come over with us? And uh, I said, uh, I said, I don't want to butt into your, your life with your friends and all. He said, no, no. He said, they'll accept you. Don't worry about it. So I did go over and uh, I met Shirley and others. Uh, I can't, I'm not good on names, but uh, I, I had, they have a place in my heart now. Amen. Appreciate that. It's good. Thank you, sir. Jack was kind of a quiet guy, but he's a very friendly fellow. Didn't, didn't know any strangers. There's just no big shot, but didn't, uh, didn't, didn't you know, there's no shots in it. Just, just, just people. Anybody else have, have anything you'd like to share real quick? Anybody? Glad to have you. Okay. All right. Shirley asked if I would sing a song for you. And I want to sing, sing this one for you. Just put yourself in Jack's shoes for a second. When engulfed by the terror of tempestuous sea, unknown waves before you, At the end of doubt and peril is eternity. Though fear and conflict seize your soul. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven of touching a hand and finding it God's a breathing new air and finding it celestial of waking up in glory and finding it When surrounded by the blackness of the darkest night Oh, how lonely death can be At the end of that long tunnel is a shining light For death is swallowed up in victory so just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven of touching a hand and finding it God a breathing new way read a little passage here, a very familiar passage for a time like this, and 
Kind of goes along with that song. Kind of goes along with the last verse of Psalm 23. He says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The night, last night that Jesus lived on earth, the night before he was crucified, he had a... We talk about the Passover, and we talk about the Lord's Supper, and the Last Supper, and all those kind of things. There's a lot of things going on that night. There was one final time of instruction. His disciples had been with him for three and a half years. They were, used to, they were accustomed to depending upon him. In fact, when they went off, he said, follow me. He said, you don't need to take an extra coat. Don't take any, extra, any money with you. I'll, basically, what he was saying, you stick with me. I'll take care of you. It's going to be okay. When they were hungry, what did he do? He fed, he fed 5,000, and he gives them each a bushel basket to take home with them. When, when they needed clothes, he, he made sure they had, had what they had and, food, and, and, and shoes on their feet. He, he provided for them. And he had said along for several months before, he said, I'm going down to Jerusalem, and they're going to, they're going to abuse me. They're going to crucify me, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. And, of course, they kind of, they kind of brushed it off. Almost, well, that can't happen. And that, that's not going to really going to happen. That day will never really come, just like today. You know, in the back of our minds, we just think, well, you know, these days, this day is never actually going to come. We know it is. But we just kind of put it off like it's just so far out. You remember when you were a kid, you were a teenager, you thought you were immortal and invincible, you know, and uh, you thought, well, we're just going to live forever. And, and, uh, and then you know, there was a few times in our life where probably you lost somebody that was your age. Remember the first time you saw somebody in an obituary in a paper that was younger than you? Things start to take perspective. And that night, finally, they got the, I think they got the, the, uh, the point. He's really, he's really talking about being dead here soon. And apparently, uh, a look of sorrow, uh, fear, came across their eyes. And Jesus looked down at his disciples in John 14, and he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now, they've been with him for three and a half years. And yet somehow, just like we have been around, uh, you know, uh, we've been in society that talks about Jesus Christ all our lives, and it's possible that we know about him, but we don't know him. We've heard the story, and maybe in our heart what we've heard is the myth. And there's actually some people, you know, some people actually who believe this. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's important a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. If we wait for the judgment, it's going to be too late. The Bible says that there was a great white throne, and those that were judged out of the books were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. See, there's a point a man wants to die after that, the judgment. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now you're saying it's the second death. The Bible says in John... I, and I say this because I want us to say, well, why are we doing this? Why, 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 why are you doing this? Because Jack is more alive today than he has ever been before. I know surely goodness and mercy may follow you all the days of life, but dwelling in the house of the Lord forever is a whole different ballgame. It's life eternal. And if you're honest with me, just as I'm trying to be honest with you, we all know that we're accountable to him. Down deep in my heart, we know there's a God. And we know that 
we will one day stand before him. We don't want to think about it. We kind of think about what will never actually come. I remember doing the funeral of my father. I didn't think my dad was going to die. He's Superman. But he did. But I also know that he had received Christ as his Savior. And I remember him laying in the bed there, and the whole family was around him, and we were just waiting. We were taking him off some tubes, but he was very coherent. And we just sat there, and we, we sang, How Great Thou Art, and Amazing Grace. And, and he was just waiting for the train to leave. <laughs> Didn't know when it was going to leave, just waiting for the train to leave. Because he had prepared. It's not something to be fearful of. You believe in God, he says, believe also in me. So why believe in God? James said, you believe in God, you do well. But the devils also believe and tremble. Believing God is, 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 uh, is us knowing that we will stand before him one day. Believing in Jesus Christ knows that God came so that when we stand before him, he won't see our sin, but he'll see the precious blood of Jesus Christ given in our place. I'll be honest with you. Again, Jack's not one to tell people what to do. Maybe, of course, maybe I'm wrong. He never was with me, but... Um, Right now, I think if he had his choice, he'd make sure we had this squared away. So let me give you real quick how we know Jack's in heaven. There's four things we need to know. And the Lord says he'll guarantee us heaven. Romans 3.10 says, For there is none, as is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Jack knew that. We sat down with Jack at the table in the kitchen, right there in his kitchen. Now, I, I had done that before, but it had been a while. They had, you all started coming not long after I got here, not long after you all started dating, I guess. Uh, and so I had had a chance to talk with him years ago, but I, it's been years ago. So I want to go back through a little bit with him. That means there's none that does right all the time. There's none righteous, no, not one. You know, if we're honest, and Jack was honest, he knew he hadn't done right all the time. Because he goes on and says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin means to miss the mark. I mean, the mark is, be, is perfection. And that's great. We, can sh we should shoot for it. But there's none that's righteous. No, not one. For all have come short of the mark. They come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of our sin is death. I've already said the point a man wants to die and after that the judgment. That's our physical death. Jack is not with us. We had a body, we have a vehicle that we live on in this earth. That's our, our physical body. When we die, we're separated from that body and from this realm. Our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, the person on the inside is separated. But the Bible says in Revelation, chapter 21, verse number 8, let me make sure I read it right for you. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I think, you know why he puts liars in there? Because I'll guarantee you somewhere along the way you weren't quite square with somebody. It might have been as simple as telling your mom you didn't eat the cookie, it wasn't you. We don't have to teach our kids not to lie. We just do it naturally. It says, they shall have their part in the lake with burning the fire and brimstone, which is a second death. What is that? That separation from God. You know, God doesn't want to send us there. And he's not looking to send us there. In fact, he's, he, he's looking to and fro. The eye of the Lord goes to and fro. So he can, he, he can, be, he, he can show himself strong, whose heart's perfect toward him. But the fact is, we're not. And so we're separated from God for eternity. If, so right now, we have the opportunity to decide if we want God in our life. And we get God in our life now We'll have God in life when we pass on. 
Bible says in Revelation that when all that happens, we stand before him. He that, he that was righteous will be righteous still. He that is filthy shall be filthy still. This is our time in, to prepare for eternity. So what is hell? Everything God is not. Everything God is not. So what do you do? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's not willing that any should die, but all should come to repentance. What does that mean? To realize we're sinners. To realize that we can't make it on our own. If we've broken the law at one point, we're guilty of it all. All we like sheep have gone astray. But our good shepherd has given his life for his sheep. You, many of you know the story of Jesus dying on the cross. He had been arrested in the garden by the religious people. Why? Because they told him they were sinners like the rest of us, and they decided they didn't like that, they going to knock him off. So they take him back to the high priest's office, and they beat him. They get tired of that, and they take it to, to, to Pilate early in the morning, the Roman governor. And they say, we want this man crucified. So what, he, what has he done? We want him crucified. Well, what did he do? Listen, if he, wasn't, if he wasn't a bad guy, we wouldn't have brought him. Okay, all right, what did he have done? Well, we want him crucified. You know how it goes. He said, well, let, let me talk to him. And he talks to Jesus a few minutes, and he comes back and says, there's no reason to, to crucify this man. He hasn't done anything wrong, nothing worthy of being crucified. And they said, no, we want him crucified. We want him crucified. So in order to be, to kind of appease the people, Pilate acquiesced and has Jesus crucified. So they take him back and the, and the soldiers whip him with, a, with a, a cat of nine tails. And the reason why I go through this, you'll, you'll know in a minute, it's nine pieces of leather with bone and potter and stuff that came around just to grab the body. They would pull it back and it would... I'm sorry. It would uh, rip, rip the body just as you pull it back. They, cried, they planted a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. It says everybody they hit him on the head with a, with a rod which would have driven his thorns into his scalp. They put a cross on his back and told him to, to carry it up the hill. Of course, he fell beneath the load. Simon of Cyrene carried the rest away. But when they got to the top of the hill, they nailed him to the cross. My point being, when the cross went up and dropped in that hole, he was bleeding from every part of his body. From the crown of thorns, the nails in his hands, and the nails in his feet, and the whipping. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Man has no blood, he has no life. And so every drop of blood that fell from his body was his life leaving him. While his life was leaving him, Jesus Christ calls out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of a sudden, he sends the separation that we said. We said, well, God's up there somewhere, I think. I mean, it makes sense for him to be there, but I've never seen him. All of a sudden, he felt the separation from God that we grew up with. Why? Because the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. All of a sudden, he had our sin, and God the Father turned his back on his only begotten Son and allowed him to die with our sins on him. A little while later, he cried out again, It is finished. Father, in thy hands, I commend my spirit. And he died. He said, what's finished? What's finished? He came to, the Bible says, he told Zacchaeus, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He told the, the disciples, he says, I've come, I'm going to give my life for a ransom for many. I'm paying the sins. They took him off the cross and they put him in a tomb. The Bible says on the third day he rose again. So does the non-Christian Jewish historian Josephus gives account of that. Other historians have given account that there was a man named Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah, who did many miracles, was crucified by the government and, and turned over, betrayed by, the, by the, Jewish, excuse me, the Jewish people. And the third day his body was gone, they couldn't find it, and his disciples died, went to the death, claiming that he had been risen from the grave. It's a fact. 
And when I was a kid, I always liked that. I said, well, I like, I like a happy ending in you know, Sunday school. You know, we have the groom to him, but he, he, he rose again. That's good. There's more to it than that. This is so good. I want you to understand this. If I had committed a crime and the, and the penalty was to go to jail for a year, after I've been there for a year, I get out because I paid the crime. Jesus was paying a crime, but it was our crime. The penalty was death, and so he died. The penalty was paid, so he no longer had to be dead. He came back to life. The resurrection is proof that all of our sins are paid for. All of them. Even the ones we haven't committed yet. Listen, all our sins were in the future when he died. You know, when, died, when Jesus died for our sins, he died for all of them, first to last, all of them. And I, always, I kind of equate that to uh, kids. You know, when you start having kids, you kind of, you have to, in your heart, you kind, of have to say, you kind of have to say to your kids, I forgive you for the rest of your life. You might as well because they're going to do something stupid. You know they are. And as soon as you think they're not going to do it, they do it again. And, you, if, and you, if, you know, if, if you're not going to forgive them for the rest of your life, you might as well kill them now because it's going to happen one of these days. But when God paid for our sins, he paid for not, the ones, not even the ones we've done, but the ones we're going to do. Now, it may not be any big sin. It might be a little thought. It might be a little word we said, a little something we, we shouldn't have done, a, curse, a cross word with our spouse or what it might have been. But all, all that is is coming short of the glory of God. Now, when Jesus was hanging across, there's one last thing we need to know. We're all sinners. Because of our sin, we deserve death and hell. But Jesus died and paid for our sins and rose again, proving our sins were paid for. I know you didn't come for this kind of message, but the fact is we can rejoice. As it says in the Bible, we don't have to sorrow those who have no hope. In fact, it says we can comfort one another with these words because of what I'm telling you here. I know where we're going to find Jack. He's not lost. We say, well, I lost my friend today. No, you didn't lose your friend. We know exactly where he is. He's in good hands with the shepherd. He's just, he's just, he's just sitting in a different fold right now. His, listen, his defense that holds him in are, are made out of gold and gates of pearl. It's just as real as us sitting here right now. But the last thing is so easy and we miss it. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a thief dying on either side of him. And often when you see the cross, you'll see the three crosses. A lot of men, that one, that one gentleman will cross the, the country and put up crosses on the hills of the interstate. You see the three crosses together. And that's because right there is the, is the uh, illustration of the decision we need to make. Jesus is dying on the cross. The people are making fun of him. And they're being whipped up by the religious crowd, the folks who think, I don't need this. I'm okay without it. After a while, one of the, the, one of the centurions, the, the soldier, says, yeah, if you're king of the Jews, get, get yourself off the cross. Finally, one of the thieves who's dying on the cross next to him says, yeah, if you're the son of God, save yourself and us too. Well, the thief on the other side calls across and says, man, don't you fear God? Don't you know we're all condemned to die here, but we justly so. You can go back and read this out of Luke, Luke 23. We justly so, but this man, he's done nothing. Of course, he wasn't, he wasn't talking with his hands. I don't think I can talk without my hands. He wasn't talking with his hands. His hands are on the cross. And he says, he turned to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned back to him and said, Verily, verily, or truly, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth here, son. That's what he's supposed to say. I'm going to tell you the truth. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now you think about it. This thief, who's going to be dead in a couple hours, says to another man who's going to be dead in a couple hours, Hey, when you get your government set up, give me a call. Come back and get me. And Jesus basically said, I'll do one better than that. You'll be with me before the day is over in paradise. Now watch me. That thief's going to be in paradise with Jesus, but he had never had a chance to be baptized. I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm all for being baptized. But baptism never saved anybody. You go in the water a dry sinner, you come out a wet sinner. Baptism is like my ring. It tells everybody that I am taken, that I made a decision. If I take it off and put it on somebody else's finger, it doesn't make them married to my wife. 
It means something because of the decision I made. That's what baptism does. I tell little kids, it's like a little, little play. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what I needed to get me to heaven. That's all it is. That thief's going to be in, in, going to be in paradise with Jesus. He never had a chance to join, join a church. Now again, my pastor, all poor folks join the church getting involved. And though you might think your you, you, church is bad enough, you can pay for your sins by going. It's not. That's not your penalty for your sin, going to church. Church is where we get to learn all the promises that God has given us and how to get them. He's going to be in paradise with Jesus, but he never had a chance to make right all the wrongs he had committed. And there's enough of them to get executed for him. What did he did, do? The Bible says, if you believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Confess with thy mouth. You know what he did? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now how he knew who Jesus was, we really don't know. But we know that he did. In fact, he calls him Lord. And that word Lord in the Greek means supreme controller. In other words, you're the big man upstairs. You've got all this in your hand. When all this settles down, you come back and get us. Somehow I knew who Jesus was, who, who Jesus was. We, he admitted himself a sinner. He says, we're getting what we deserve. And he called upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. The Bible says that, that he didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might have life. He that believeth not is condemned already. We don't have to do anything to go to hell. Just do nothing. It's kind of like sitting on, a, on the, the Sus Susquehanna River. Get in a boat and sit on the river. Do nothing. Where are you going to end up? Down the river. What's the works? We work, we work the works of God. Jesus says, believe on him whom he hath sent. He brings us right back to where we started. You believe in God? Good. Now, God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the amends maker, and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm not going to stand here and claim that Jack was the spiritual giant. He's kind of quiet. I don't think he liked to get in the midst of a lot of stuff. And, but, in, but in the quietness of his own heart, he gave testimony, having believed Jesus Christ had died and paid for his sins. For by grace, undeserved benefit, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a work, lest any man should boast. God's willing to give that gift to anyone who's willing to admit that they need it and is willing to receive it, to believe it and receive it. That's why we know where Jack is. And we call this, I was at a funeral earlier this week, one of the deacons at the church where I came from, and they called a celebration of life. And you know what we assume, we're celebrating the life he lived here on earth, and we have. But we can celebrate life because he's more alive today than Jack has ever been on this earth. That's the honest and goodness truth. The Lord says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I dare you. Father, we thank you for meeting with us here this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to get in your word. And Lord, I pray, I know we've, these folks came, in, they came to hear about Jack, and the fact is, because of you, Jack's alive today. Alive and well. No more cancer. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. Because he's with you. 
Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I wouldn't do anything to embarrass you. Nothing. But I do want to give you an opportunity. Let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you'd be in heaven? If you don't know that for sure, let me ask you another question. If God will take you just like you are, forgive your sin, and give you a home in heaven, would you let him do it? Again, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I won't come to you, and, but you certainly can come to me. But if you like right where you are in the quietness of this time, from your heart to God's heart, mean it with all your heart, best you can, I can help you trust Christ. When I got married, I didn't have all my vows mem- memorized, but I meant them. The preacher helped me get through that. He gave me piece by piece. I can help you right now, the word of prayer, to receive Christ as your Savior. And if you'll do it from your heart and, you know, and, and believe it, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. From your heart to God's heart, would you just pray something like this? Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that because of my sin, I deserve death and hell. But I believe that Jesus died and paid for all my sin. Rose again the third day, proving all my sins were paid for. Right now, the best I know how, I accept the death of Jesus as full payment for my sin. I'm trusting him alone for my salvation. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life and a home in heaven. Thank you for saving me. My heads are bowed and their eyes are closed. Again, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But as a testimony toward Jack, if, if you prayed that, you meant it with your heart, would you just slip your hand up real quick? Amen. Amen. There are others. I want to make sure I had that squared away. Just to slip your hand. I won't, I won't embarrass you. I'm not going not to do anything like that. I want to make sure I had that all squared away. I appreciate that. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And I thank you for the life of Jack, life of Jack Kendig. appreciate all these family and friends and church members coming. And Lord, it's going to be some time that we will be, uh, we want to call him up or stop by and see him and go out with lunch with him and he's not going to be here. He's going to be with you. And there's going to be some tears and maybe some laughs and, but we're going to miss him. But we know he's okay. He's with you. And Lord, I pray that each one here knows that for sure and has that settled. And if they don't, they'll get it settled real soon. So Lord, put, a, put your hand a blessing on these dear folks. We put this time in your hands. We give the praise in Christ's name. Amen. We, uh, they asked if I would just sing one, if you all would just sing one song with us here as a closing. And uh, would you stand with me? You could take a hymn book in front of you, hymn number 300. And uh, we're going to sing just the first and third verses of, of In the Garden. Would you stand with me? I'll sing it with you, of course. Hymn number 300, and there should be a hymn book right there in front of you, and we'll do this as our closing. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own, and the 
joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. Three, I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. Here we go. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Father, thank you so much for meeting with us here this morning. Again, we ask for your special care and your grace during these times, these next three days, days, these next few weeks, maybe the next few months. My Lord, I pray that you give grace. Thank you so much for the joy we can have knowing he's with you. And though he probably can't hear us from heaven, we know that you can. Tell him we love him, and we're going to miss him, and we'll see Jack soon. God bless you. Our Lord, thank you. In Christ's name, amen. And God bless you as well. And uh, we, we, we are grateful for you for, for being here, and thank you for coming. You may stay and, and, uh, and chat if you, if you wish, and uh, we appreciate it. God bless you. Well, you're dismissed. <laughs>